Today I'm on a mission to find a broken Nissan 350Z, fix it up and sell it for double on profit. This is gonna be fun. You may have seen on the Animize YouTube channel that I bought a 350Z, fixed it and sold it for double on profit. Well, I thought, what if it was possible to do again? So me and my friend Michael were on the hunt for a new project car to work on. We always send car listings back and forth and never really go ahead to see any of the cars. Until my friend Sev sent me something interesting. It was a 2008 HR Nissan 350Z with 40 bumbers on the clock. And better yet, the asking price was £6,250, which was way under market value because as this had a HR engine, it made it a lot rarer. But we'll get into why that is later. Later. So I headed over to where, where it was located, and oh my days, this was a beautiful example of a 350. There was a couple little nicks and knacks, but overall it was superb. However, there were some issues to address. Main one being I didn't have an MOT because of the exhaust and a mysterious ball joint issue. So I popped my head under the car and straight away the ball joint looked a little bit odd. I was just hoping and praying these issues weren't too problematic because I needed this car to pass MOT. Because if it failed MOT, well, that would be a big issue and a lot of money may have to be spent. So I want to make sure that we get this done right. And I negotiated a little deal to get the price down just a little bit and it was sold and me and michael bought it for six thousand pounds and now we had it it was time to look at it in some better lighting and see what's up it's a big one it's a big one brother <laughs> it's custom clearly custom but 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 now the question is do we like the custom exhaust or should we put the twin exhaust <laughs> that's quite cool so take it i like it very japanese i don't know i haven't made up my mind yet but it sounds Friggin' amazing. Quite loud. Let's leave it for a little bit, let's see. We'll leave it for a little bit. The 350 was pretty flipping dirty, so it was time to give it a buff. You can tell there was quite a bit of road grit on it, tree sap, bird dookie. And unfortunately, I didn't have a pressure washer, so I kind of just stuck my thumb on a hose. But it definitely worked just to give it a quick rinse. And now she's looking nice and clean. But I couldn't really say the same about the inside. Not only was it dirty, but there's quite a lot of scratches along the black pieces of plastic inside the car. So I definitely want to try to take those off to repaint. But I will only tackle this stuff if I can get this car past MOT. So let's worry about this later. Okie dokie. So basically, this is the ball joint. This is not good bad. We need to replace that and we actually have the piece already. It literally came with the car. Okay, okay, let's just pause this for a second because you might be asking what the f is a ball joint? Well, basically the ball joint is what holds the wheel to the car. They connect to the lower control arm and knuckle. The ball joint is in the shape of a ball so it allows it to move in multiple directions. And when they go bad, the ball can become worn and loose or worse, it can pop out. So it's safe to say that this was a pretty important component and we definitely needed to get this thing fixed. So yeah, if you didn't know, now you know. So we're gonna put this on, hopefully take that off. I don't know how to take it off, but we'll figure it out. Looks like you just have to take off a couple things here and we're gonna get this on. Fresh thing. I was meant to be ready to take this thing out, but it turns out I was missing a special tool to remove the ball joint. Yeah, that's right. Me and Michael did no research going into this. We thought we could just screw it out or something, but that wasn't the case at all. So we had to leave the car and come back another day. And by the magic of next day prime delivery, we had the cups to remove this thing. So I got to spraying a bunch of WD-40 penetrant fluid to loosen up all the rusty ass nuts that were on the control arm. And man, these things were rusted pretty bad. But first I tackled the spring arm bolt and then it was the bolt for the suspension. But this was way easier said than done because boy, there was a bunch of rust in this thing. It took a lot of WD-40 and persistence on the suspension and drop link to remove them. And then it was time to try to take out the ball joint, but it seemed to be infinitely spinning. So I took a pair of vice grips to try to stop it from spinning and I thought it was working. Yes, it's legitimately. It feel nice though. No, no, but trust me, it's doing it. Finally, bruv. Until I realized it wasn't. Oh no, oh, it's spinning a bit now. I'll reset a little bit, we'll marinate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's still spinning. We had run into a problem. So it was time for plan B. Saw the fuck out of it. Yeah, that's right. I didn't have a Dremel or anything. I just had to saw through this bitch. Yeah, it wasn't the best way of doing it. <laughs> Ball joint is out! Yes! <laughs> Bing bong. Ah. Now, three hours getting this bolt off, brother. And now that was out, it was time to back out the cups. I don't know if these things have a special name. I just call them pressure cups or ball joint removal tools. And yeah, they require quite a bit of force to take out these ball joints. Go on, Dean. I feel like I'm gonna poo. It's my broken arm, by the way, I'm pulling. Oh! 
moving. You see, the ball joints are installed under pressure. So taking them out was pretty damn hard. Come on. Oh. What was that? I don't know what that was. It's okay, it's okay. It's oh, shit. So much pain. <laughs> Fucking hell, bro. This is painful as f to be honest. <laughs> So it's time to put in the new ball joint. I use the pressure cups once again with a little plate on the bottom to leverage it downwards and push the new one in. And then I use the safety pin from the last ball joint to put back onto the bottom to stop this thing from moving. And then it was time to put it all back together. So we tackled one of the biggest problems already, the ball joint. Now it's time for the headlights. On the failed MOT report, it said that the headlight aim was way too high. So I was gonna see if there's anything I could do to try to fix that. And there definitely was. The headlights had little cogs on the back of them that if you pushed with a flathead screwdriver, it would actually adjust the height of the headlight. For some reason, these ones were set way too high. I don't know why. They were basically acting like fog lights. And we just slowly adjusted them back to normal, making sure both of them were level and at the correct height. I watched the Noel Chris Fix video on how to adjust them properly, and I kind of just followed those steps. So if you want to go see how to do that, click on the top right, because that is a tutorial that helped me do this. And now that was fixed and adjusted properly, it was time to address another slightly concerning issue. You have an engine light when we start the Car. I've got an OBD here. I'm gonna plug this in. I'm gonna try to identify whatever the flip that is. I'm assuming it's exhaust related. I hope it's exhaust related because if it's anything else, then I'm gonna be pissed. Plug it in. Yeah. Boom, shakalaka. Hello. I really hope it's no bullshit and I hope I can clear it. System date is codes found one. Read codes. O2 sensor circuit range performance bank one sensor one. Okay. So you have a sensor issue. Nice. And if we erase that cold, erase done. Press any key to. Okay, if it started, hopefully. Hey, no check engine light, blood. But I might come back. I'm not gonna lie, it's a temporary fix. Interesting, O2 sensor, that's interesting. And I can't tell you how relieving this was because having a check engine light is an automatic MOT failure. So having that cleared out is great. And now it was time to take it to the MOT center. So I dropped it off and went with my boys to Toby Carvery, which had some pretty banging munch, by the way, and nervously waited for the result. And once I finished the food, I went back to see the car and the inspection was still going on. These men were preying up this whip, sticking their torches in little hard to reach spots and all that. But then I was handed the paper and it passed. What? That's right. There was a couple minors, but I wasn't too worried about them. The car was now ready for the road. Well, of course, with insurance and tax and all that. But I thought, why not take it out and a little spin with Michael to celebrate and to see how the car really handled. You know what I noticed about this as well? You can hear it breathing so much more because of the dual intakes. Uh, you hear it sounds so much meatier just because of those dual intakes. And that's obviously uh, due to the fact that it's the HR variant. Yeah. So the 350Z came in three different engine types. You had the bog standard DE engine, you had the DE rev up, and then you had the HR. The rev up was just basically an upgraded version of the DE, and the HR was kind of like a complete overhaul of the previous engine. It basically offered more horsepower and has a dual intake system, along with some upgraded internals. If you go to any car meet in the UK, you're usually gonna see one 350Z at the very least. And most of the time, they look pretty tired and ragged out by people that just drift the living shit out of them. And I'm not saying that's what you shouldn't do with the car, but these cars are only gonna start getting rarer. And I do genuinely think they're one of the most iconic jack cars to exist. So yeah, now you know the difference between all the engines. And now you know why this one was the best one to have, which also meant it was the most valuable. But enough of that, let's get on to the interior. Mm. Paint on that is well f mate. As I said earlier, the paint on some of the trims inside the car was not in the best condition. <laughs> So I was gonna try my best to take everything apart carefully. And my plan was to respray anything that had any scratches on it at all. And by the looks of it, there was quite a lot of panels that were scratched. LOL. So I got to work with sanding each of the panels. We had to get all the paint off and we had to get the surface rough enough for primer to go on. Also, I don't know what this paint is, but I'm assuming it's like Plasti Dip or something because it just comes off when you scratch it. But I've sprayed isopropyl alcohol all over it and now it's coming off with ease. I've got this like plastic scraper, which is actually like a window scraper, but it does the job because it takes it right off, brother. Love that. And then it was time for primer. I always just use Halford's paint and primer for this kind of stuff. I don't think it's too important to go crazy in the paint, but yeah, it's personal preference. And then it was time to spray on the satin black. Yeah. 
how to sit. I don't know if it's a paint or if it's an aqua. If you put it in warm water, it sprays nicer. Ah, sh Another little tip I was told was to heat up the surface of the paint that I was about to apply lacquer to, to avoid getting any orange peel, which is kind of like when the lacquer looks a bit bumpy. And then it was time to install it all back in the car. And it just looks that much better. Like seriously, the interior just had a new feel to it now. These trims were back to a solid black quality color. But the interior was still quite dirty, so we gave it a deep clean. Brother, ew. Using some Yanomai's interior clean, not sponsored, I rubbed up the door cards, sent the console and steering wheel. And trust me, this stuff does its job. It cut through the dirt and removed the shiny looks of the leather, making them look new once again. Again, not sponsored by Animize, even though I work there, completely unbiased opinion. But with that all the way, there was one more thing I wanted to do. The engine bay had a pretty grimy look to it, so I was gonna see what I could do to clean it up. This wasn't necessary at all, but as I wanted to sell this thing on, I wanted to make sure it was in tip-top condition for the next owner. So I just want to show you the levels that we've gone to, okay? So I've done a half and half clean, and this is the before. It's like green, brown. This wax stuff is an absolute bitch to get off. I've been using brake and clutch cleaner, spraying it all over and just digging it off. It's so long. From what I've seen online, it's like a wax protectant, but it's just really old. But on this side, look at it. It is exquisite looking. I'm even thinking of going to the extent of taking out the bolts and respraying them and then putting them back on just to make it that much nicer. But you can just tell the difference of the air intakes and the plastic. This is just, ah. Yeah, but for now, let's just carry on detailing this engine bay and making it look as good as possible. Okay, so car is done. It's been a couple of weeks since I posted a Facebook marketplace listing on it. And I've got somebody today that's put a deposit down and is very, very interested. I posted it up at 12,000 pounds. Now it might seem like a lot, but again, I'm trying to make double my money. I had a look on Autotrade and eBay and all 2008 HRs are near this price and are almost double the mileage. So that's why I'm confident with the 12,000 pound price. And that's why people are messaging me asking about the car because it is a reasonable price. But the guy that's coming today is coming down from Oxford. So he's coming pretty far. So I guess Let's wait and see what happens. And it didn't take a lot of convincing because when this guy saw the car, he fell in love with it. He was a bit younger and this was his first real wheel drive car. So I told him to take it easy because obviously this car can kick out a bit. But he offered me and Michael 11,500 pounds. And you know what? We were feeling good, so we took it. He'd come that far and he was really easy with us. So essentially, we bought this car for 6,000 pounds and put just under 100 pounds into it, fixing it. Obviously, I had a lot of the tools at hand already, but it just goes to show you can do this on a budget and make it profitable. So all in all, we made five and a half grand, which is basically double, okay? We can round that up. And yeah, not a bad result at all. Every now and then, very nice examples of these cars are popping up really cheap. So I definitely advise you to keep your eyes out because even if you find one with a couple problems like this one, maybe go ahead and try fix it. And if you don't want to keep it, sell it on and you probably would make a profit. So yeah, I guess it's on to the next project car, which is coming soon. But if you did actually like this video, please consider subscribing and checking out some of the other videos on this channel. But other than that, I have been Ray Ski and bless up.